Great. Good morning. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to cover some of the same things that Steve and Luke have covered in sort of very general terms, but I'm also very grateful for any feedback and um, discussion um, later on. So let me start with a disclaimer. I'm not a statistician. I'm not a data scientist. I'm not a computer scientist. I'm an, an evolutionary anthropologist. Um, which may come to a surprise uh, to some of you as to why I'm talking here. Um, and I think um, partly I'm here uh, and I, I sort of would like to encourage people to think in terms of the fact that we're all computational researchers. The moment you're storing data on your machine, uh, the, the, the moment you're storing analysis files on your machines, effectively you're a computational researcher because you are interacting with your computer in storing and uh, handling those um, files. And so in that context, this is a sort of a little uh, uh, pledge, really, or a little uh, request, is to uh, think of a broader context uh, from sort of open science, which is a term that is often used, to open research, which applies more generally also to uh, researchers, for example, in the humanities, which may adopt some of the same techniques and, uh, and things that we're talking about today. And then uh, another label that has uh, appeared more recently, which is a sort of open scholarship. So it's not just science, it's also research in other domains that can benefit from some of the things that uh, we're talking about today. Uh, my main credential for being here, I guess, <clears throat> is that I set up and run a project called Reproducible Research o Oxford at the University of Oxford. And so in this context, I have been uh, thinking about these issues um, in an academic setting for, for a few years now. And so I'll tell you more about this um, uh, later on. Okay, so uh, let me start with the definition of the problem, uh, sort of very uh, loose definition for now. Um, and, and the concern that we all have is that results can only be trusted if they can be re-derived by the original researchers or by others working independently. So this can be new in six months' time, trying to um, re-derive the results, or another research group who's interested in uh, checking what you've done and then building on uh, what you've done. And I use the term re-derived here because uh, there is a lot of discussion and some confusion about what reproducibility actually means, is it repeatability, so we'll, I'll talk about that um, later. Um, and as I was putting together this talk a few months ago, I realized that ultimately uh, this has to do with trust. So can we trust a result? Um, and that's sort of the first level. Well, if we can't trust the result, then can we trust the researcher? Um, is it uh, because the researcher made a mistake? So if I can't uh, re-derive that result, maybe the researcher made a mistake, or maybe he or she maliciously uh, committed fraud. I mean, those are hopefully rare cases, but you see how it, it escalates from not being able to trust the result to not being able to trust the researcher. And I think more deeply, this leads to questions about the whether we can trust the process. As scientists, we're very passionate about what we do. We're trying to sort of uh, um, uh, get closer to the truth. And we have this idea, we're trained this in, in, in this frame of mind that doing this work will lead us uh, to uh, sort of closer to the truth. Um, uh, but if we can't trust the results and if we can't trust the researchers, then we, we can't trust this process that is so beautiful, um, which is a scientific process. Now, um, people have talked about a reproducibility crisis uh, in, in recent years, and so I'm showing you here some data um, uh, by discipline, so the different colors uh, represent different disciplines, for papers in Scopus that have one of those terms relating to reproducibility in the title or abstract. And so as you can see from the 1970s to 2014, when this data ended, um, the number of papers has grown up um, quite uh, dramatic, has grown quite substantially. Uh, the inset is showing you uh, the volume uh, by discipline over the last uh, two years in that data set, again, to, to show you that there is an increase, even controlling for uh, the volume of publication, which has, of course, um, increased. Um, the colors go from maths at the bottom to uh, the arts and humanities at the top, and the big green slice in the middle, that's a sort of biomedical sciences, just to give you an idea. Um, so there is data showing that uh, concern, at least in, in terms of uh, published papers, has um, uh, increased. Um, 
Now, does this mean that uh, scientists have become more dishonest? Uh, no. Uh, there is more awareness of this issue, uh, and also there is more research on these issues. So there is a field of study now called meta-research, or research, research on research, which tries to understand um, the incentives, for example, that drive uh, scientists and researchers, um, how we uh, communicate our results, um, how we evaluate whether research is solid, uh, and so on. So I think part of the uh, um, uh, increased attention to this topic is due to the increased awareness, which I think is, is a good thing, and obviously increased data and increased techniques that we have to analyze these data. So again, it's not that I don't think scientists are necessarily more dishonest than they were 30 years ago, but we have more uh, awareness. Uh, in any case, uh, the point is that every week now there is a paper, or more, one, more than one paper, showing that uh, um, there are problems with uh, resor results that have been uh, published. And here's the inevitable XKCD. I could have written this talk using, <laughs> using XKCDs, but I thought that would have been a bit, uh, a bit too nerdy. Uh, but so just to, just to say that uh, there is this increased awareness. And in fact, this is data from a survey that was published in Nature in 2016. Um, so they surveyed uh, over 1,500 uh, scientists um, and uh, asking whether uh, they felt that the, there is a reproducibility crisis. And uh, over half of the respondents uh, are claimed that, yes, there is a significant crisis, with another 38% uh, uh, claiming that they think there is a, a slight crisis. So, um, 80 percent, uh, well, 90 percent of, of, of researchers who re responded to this survey uh, thought that there is a crisis. Obviously, there are uh, issues with uh, self-selection in, in the people who responded, but, but clearly there is this, um, uh, this sense out there. And this is an issue that is, is quite prevalent uh, uh, and prominent today. This then is reflected in perceptions among the public. Um, Steve also uh, mentioned some of these examples earlier. Um, this is just one. This is a, a cover from an issue of The Economist that was published in 2013, again, uh, um, covering some of the issues and distorted incentives that uh, are uh, found in, in science um, today. Now, a more recent development in this uh, area is uh, this notion that uh, as much as there is perhaps a crisis, there is also a crisis narrative that we need to be perhaps uh, careful about. Um, so these are th the titles from three papers uh, in a recent issue pub published in PNAS in May uh, of this year, so very recent. There were about 15 papers, and three of these were looking at how uh, perceptions of the crisis is reported in the media um, and what the evidence for this um, is. And I thought this was quite interesting as, some, as somebody who's an advocate, advocate and quite um, sort of uh, uh, loud and talking about these issues a lot. I thought this was quite, quite interesting and it made me think that um, we need to keep talking about these issues, but we also want to be careful in how we um, talk about them. And um, the, the, um, the paper by uh, Fanelli in the middle there, um, uh, in that paper he's actually arguing that uh, there isn't actually evidence of a crisis, certainly not to the extent that we uh, would imagine from all these reporting that we have. Um, and he also cautions that uh, we need to be careful in how we talk about this because uh, it may be putting uh, uh, other you know, young people coming into the field. If we can't trust science, then we have to be careful. Uh, but also, it might uh, breed uh, a, a credibility crisis for um, science. And this is something, obviously, that we want to be very careful about. And so, there was a case in point uh, shortly after this was published in, in March of last year, sorry, in March of this year, uh, by the National Academy of Sciences of the NAS. Another NAS, which is the National Association of Scholar, which is not the National Academy of Sciences, published uh, this report. This is uh, 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 called the NAS Irreproducibility Report. And it's, it's a relatively long document. And if you look through the, the table of contents, 
then uh, many of the topics that are covered there are topics that you would expect to be covered in discussions about uh, reproducibility. But if you actually read between the lines, and, and there are some quite explicit uh, uh, comments in there, effectively this is an attack on science. It's saying, well, scientists are obviously dishonest, they are uh, um, uh, driven by these distorted incentives, so we can't trust science, hence climate, climate change is a hoax. <laughs> Not quite as explicitly, but, but basically, um, so the point I'm trying to make here is that we have to be careful. Let's keep talking about these issues, but let's, let's be careful in how we talk about them. Fun, fun read. Not. Okay, I think part of the problems I've come to realize is that um, it's complicated because um, it, it's a relatively new area. There's lots of hype about, uh, around it, and... Um, Definitions, for example, are not settled, and so different people in, working in different disciplines, sometimes different people working in the same discipline, very often uh, mean the same, different, the same things by different terms or different things by the same time. So it is uh, a little bit complicated. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to cover some of the uh, nuance that comes into definitions, and this is one that helps me when I get confused about which label I'm using. Uh, this is one that helps me. Um, so this is, was introduced by Peng in 2011, and he introduced this notion that there is a reproducibility spectrum. And at one end of the spectrum is reproducibility. And so this is whether a researcher can derive identical results from the same data. At the other end of the spectrum is what he calls replicability. Uh, and so this is whether um, uh, it is possible to derive consistent results with new data, new methods. Now, in this uh, uh, spectrum, reproducibility is the minimal attainable standard, right? Any science that you do uh, and publish, uh, you should strive for reproducibility. Replicability is the gold standard. That's what we should all strive uh, for, uh, but it's not always possible to uh, reach replicability. Um, for example, if you're an astrophysicist uh, who works with satellite data, there may not be another satellite <laughs> that can collect data that can allow you to conduct other studies that will lead you to consistent results. If you're a medical researcher and you rely on uh, a large uh, trial, for example, you may not have the funds or the subjects uh, to, uh, uh, to obtain another data set. So replicability is the gold standard. Uh, many results uh, coming from different uh, um, uh, studies using different methods, uh, if they're all consistent, then they give us a sense that we are approaching the truth, that, that we are uh, uh, correct in our inferences, um, but we, it's not always achievable. Reproducibility should uh, be what we all do in, 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 in our sort of practical day-to-day -day work. So this is one way to think about this. Um, another way to think about it, which was proposed, proposed more recently by Goodman et al, um, um, effectively gets rid of all the different terms, replicability, reproducibility, repeatability, generalizability, sort of many of these terms that I use and are using consistently, as I said. Um, and they say, let's just use reproducibility because this is the term that is mostly, uh, most recognized out there. Uh, and they then distinguish uh, 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 between three levels. And the first level is uh, methods reproducibility. So this is where the researcher provides enough detail about the study and procedures so that somebody else can uh, reproduce or rederive um, the results. The second level is what they call results reproducibility. Uh, so somebody uh, performs an independent study with different data, for example, and they obtain uh, um, the same results. So this is effectively similar to the replicability um, in the previous framework that I showed you. And then the final level, and this is interesting, um, I think, and not one that is talked about too much, is what they call inferential reproducibility. Um, and this is the idea that different researchers arrive at um, qualitatively similar conclusions. Because Steve and I might get the same results from the same data set. We might get different results from the same data set. Even if we get the, even if we get, um, the same results, our conclusions might be different. We might interpret those uh, results differently. And so this is the level of inferential reproducibility, uh, which I think is not one that is talked about um, too much, but um, it seems worth pointing out. 
And finally, um, Philip Stark has proposed this neologism, uh, this idea of pre-producibility. So that before uh, reproducibility comes pre-producibility. So if you uh, uh, document your methods and uh, uh, materials in sufficient details uh, that somebody else can re-derive your results, can, can go and, and do the experiment or analysis again, then your, your study is pre-producible, and that effectively uh, uh, is a prerequisite for reproducibility. So he, he, um, he has a, a sort of a, a very cute definition he calls um, uh, the methods uh, section eff effectively as a scientific uh, recipe that allows others uh, to repeat the experiments or the analysis. And it, it gives this example of making a loaf of bread. Um, there are some details that I don't need to uh, include in my recipe, the brand of flour that I use. It's not a, a useful uh, bit of detail to include. But um, uh, just telling you that uh, the loaf of bread includes flour is not going to get you very far in making a loaf of bread. Likewise, telling you that the loaf of bread includes flour, yeast, and, um, and uh, salt and water is not going to get you very far into making a loaf of bread. What you need is a sufficiently detailed description of the procedure to uh, be able to make a loaf of bread. Um, and so this is a sort of this idea of a scientific recipe. You need to give enough details in your methods effectively for somebody else to be able to uh, conduct the experiment or analysis again. So these are just some ideas to get you to sort of think and appreciate the nuance that is behind these big labels that we sometimes use uh, in, this, in these discussions. Um, also want to point out that uh, having worked now for several years with researchers from many different disciplines, I've come to uh, realize that it's not just about definition, it's also about what people are worried about. So if you talk to psychologists, for example, uh, they're mainly worried about stats, effectively. Uh, that's what their concerns about reproducibility um, uh, uh, mainly focus on. This is a diagram from a paper that was published by uh, Marcus Munafo and, and a large number of collaborators last year. Uh, and so this is a diagram of the hypothetical deductive models of, of the scientific method, where you, um, you generate and specify your, your hypothesis, then you design the study, conduct um, your study, collect your data, do your analysis, then you interpret the results, then you publish, and then the sort of cycle continues. And in purple, they've highlighted possible threats at each, of, at each step of this uh, uh, path, if you like, um, uh, including uh, failures to control for bias, low statistical power, poor quality control, p-hacking, so uh, analyzing your data in many different ways until something comes out significant, uh, publication bias, only publishing positive results and hiding negative results, uh, harking, hypothesizing after the results are known, etc. So um, this is one view of what the issue uh, is about. Uh, but uh, again, the focus varies across di disciplines. So this is an opinion piece that was published in, in, in PNAS um, uh, in May this year. Um, from a group of researchers from sort of more of a maths and uh, computer science background. And they argued, well, in, in some of these disciplines, we don't have these problems because we don't have statistical problems, maybe because we're just doing uh, uh, mathematical proof, so there is, uh, there is no data there. Uh, we don't have issues with experimental design. And in this context, failures to replicate are essential to integrating different uh, observations and idea in a, into a coherent theory. This is how these fields have progressed. And they give four examples of um, situations where somebody came up with a result, which uh, some, uh, some time later was shown to not generalize as much as the research that had originally thought. And that, that's not, that's not a, a flaw, that's a feature of the scientific process. That's how science progresses, by uh, integrating results and sort of realizing that actually uh, this result doesn't generalize, we need, we need uh, a broader explanation. And they conclude by arguing that the discovery that an experiment does not replicate is not a lack of success, but an opportunity. So it's not a flaw, it's a feature. Um, a failure to reproduce is only the first step in scientific inquiry. In many, in many ways, how science responds to these failure is what determines whether it succeeds. So I, I, I encourage you, if you're interested in this point of view, to go and read that paper. They give four examples, which I won't try and, and summarize here, because they're not from my own 
uh, field and area. Uh, but they are quite interesting, and um, it, it's, I still need to get my head around this because I think what they, what they say actually makes sense. Um, but I also appreciate the view from psychology, for example, or from other disciplines where there are certainly issues with low statistical power, for example, harking, p-hacking. So two contrasting views. And again, I'm mentioning these just to bring some nuance to these discussions behind these big labels of reproducibility, reproducibility crisis, etc. So going back to the uh, problem, which I define loosely as um, uh, <laughs> that we can only trust results if they can be rederived by yourself or by others working independently, uh, I think that uh, part of the solution, and what I claim is actually a low-hanging fruit, is in how we train researchers. Um, or currently not, uh, we don't train researchers to think about some of, of these issues. So addressing um, uh, uh, some issues can actually be done relatively easily. It takes time, it takes some effort, but it can be done. Um, so um, there is a paper which, which uh, talks about sort of this prevention approach. So fixing the crisis is the doctor giving you medication, but what can we do as preventative measure? And what we can do as a preventative measure is to train people in how to use some of, some, some of these tools. Um, and so I think generally, certainly in the fields that I interact with, um, but I, 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 I think more generally, and, and I, this is, these, these comments are not necessarily um, field specific, uh, we need to change the approach in how we do computing and research from sort of this end, which is not reproducible, where researchers share files of an email, for example, where you update your manuscripts with your results uh, um, uh, manually uh, by copying and pasting uh, from the result from the statistical software into a work document, for example. Um, Everything is done in, 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 um, uh, in a graphical world where everything is done where these mouse trails and you're clicking, copying and pasting, um, uh, and so on, uh, using menus. It's very hard to reproduce those trails. Um, uh, it's impossible to reproduce somebody else's. <laughs> so if you've done statistical analysis in SPSS, for example, anybody here experience of SPSS? Yeah, lots of menus. Lots of options, lots of output, and so my experience, the, my little experience using SPSS is then, I don't know if anybody understands the, the, the hundreds and hundreds of tables of output, and then you sort of look for the one <laughs> result that seems consistent, and then, yeah, so that's not a good way to do sites. So we can go from this world to that world where the data, for example, is, is in a shared repository, the analysis scripts are in, in, in a shared repository, um, um, researchers use version control, so it's clear who um, changed what, when, and why. Um, the documents where you describe your results are um, updated automatically, so in a sort of dynamic uh, world, um, where you don't go in and copy and paste the results from uh, our SPSS into a Word document, for example. So some of these changes are relatively simple um, and they, they can be implemented by most people, I would argue, who is, is uh, willing to, to pick up some new um, skills and some new um, tools. And this is not the solution to all the problems, of course, but I, 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 I would like to think that it is a solution to many of the problems that we'll see. And I'll give you a few examples of things that have gone wrong because research has ever necessarily um, thought about how to do things. So this is a paper uh, from an area relatively close to my field. It was published in Nature in 2005, and it made the cover of Nature, which for some people is a big deal. Um, and the paper looked at uh, dancing in Jamaica, so they had people dance, and then they stripped all sort of identifying features, and they came up with those little stick figures. And then they had uh, participants write the symmetry of the dancing and the sort of attractiveness. <clears throat> and they were able to show uh, that this dancing reveals symmetry and then link this to attractiveness. And this is linked to some theory in evolutionary biology about how symmetry reveals uh, um, a good um, environment during your development. So symmetric features are a signal of uh, quality 
of high quality. Anyways, so that's, that's the theory. Showing this effect in humans, big deal, nature publication, uh, cover of nature. Um, now, Will Brown was a postdoc, I think, at the time, working on this. And um, a few years later, sort of rumors in, in the field started um, surfacing uh, that the senior author on this paper, Bob Trivers, wasn't happy. And uh, this took several years, and it uh, culminated in a retraction of the paper from Nature. There was a lot of debate, a lot of discussion as to what the issue was. But if you, if you read this piece that accompanies the retraction, one of the things that the authors cannot agree on was which was the correct version or the original version of the data. So they had different versions of, of the data set stored on different machines, and they couldn't agree which, which was the correct one. And so the senior author accused the other authors of, of um, manipulating the data to get the results they wanted, et cetera, et cetera. Hugely embarrassing. Huge waste of money, of research time, you know, taxpayer money. Uh, these are smart people. They should know how to store data files. But again, it goes back to the example that Steve showed, for example, of you know, the final, 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 really, really final, supervisor's comments, really final doc. Um, yeah, so huge embarrassment, of course, um, not great for your career. Another example uh, which relates more to um, data analysis, um, this is a paper that was published in uh, American Economic Review, which is the top journal in economics by um, uh, Carmen Reinhardt and, and Kenneth Rogoff in, 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 in 2010. These are two Harvard economists. And they published a paper showing that uh, growth is stifled by public debt in, in, in simple um, terms. Now, the reason I, I, I make this, I, I sort of give this example is because these results were taken by policymakers in, 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 during the financial crisis as the evidence for austerity measures. They were explicitly referring to this paper to justify austerity measures. So this is a paper that had a direct impact on my life, on your life, uh, on this country and other countries' um, policies uh, for the last uh, uh, eight years and will have repercussions for generations. So, um, now a student, uh, a graduate student uh, at Michigan, I think, in 2013, um, wanted to re replicate this, this study, and so he started playing around with the data, as you do. And he uncovered uh, a number of problems, and one of the problems, there are, there are many problems with the analysis and other details, but one of the problems, it turns out, is that the authors had updated their spreadsheet uh, with some additional lines of data, and they hadn't forgotten to, you know how you drag the little cursor to update the formula to include those additional lines of data? They'd forgotten to do that. Genuine mistake, it can happen if you're doing things manually, those things happen, um, are, are more likely to happen. Uh, and so uh, this is one mistake that was uncovered uh, by, by these researchers. Hugely embarrassing, again, something that really shouldn't be affecting our lives in the way that it has. And then the final one, uh, <laughs> the final one is one that I, I've learned about via Twitter recently, which I think is quite cute. Um, so apparently there is an, uh, uh, an error in Excel, which Microsoft is aware of. Um, uh, which, uh, so Excel incorrectly assumes that the year 1900 is a leap year. The reason for this is historical. Uh, apparently it was convenient to do so in Lotus 1, 2, 3. Um, and it was very inconvenient to fix it. <laughs> now, any version of Excel that you and I will have used in our lives will include this uh, problem. Uh, so all recent versions of Excel have this problem. And so if you scroll down and read through the docu documentation, um, uh, Microsoft say, well, we could fix this, but everything would go to hell, basically. All these things would happen. <laughs> so we're not going to fix it, because if we don't fix it, there's only one function that is affected. And most people, uh, and it is only applies to uh, dates before 
uh, March 1st, 1900. But most users don't use dates before March 1st, 1900, so we're not going to bother uh, fixing this. Now, I know a lot of archaeologists, a lot of historians. I'm pretty sure they use dates <laughs> before March 1st, 1900, and so this might well be a problem. Now, this is one of, of many, and I don't want to pick on Excel, but uh, this is one of those cases where I think one thing that we can do is not rely on proprietary software, um, not, re not rely on this sort of uh, black, black, black box software where we don't really know what is going on, or when we do know what is going on, there is no incentive to fix the problem um, because it's not convenient to do so. So those are three things that, um, uh, three, three, three sort of problems that can happen and, and that can be resolved relatively easily by, again, changing how we train our graduate students, for example, um, by uh, demanding training in these areas if you are a graduate student. So this is how uh, the sort of shift that I've implemented in my own research group um, uh, to try and, and address some of these issues. Um, so. This is a slogan, if you like, from the reproducibility uh, uh, movement. Um, and the idea is, is, is that if you're publishing a paper in the way that we're used to publishing papers now, um, that's not scholarship that you're putting out there. You're putting out there ad, an ad, basically, for your work. The scholarship is the complete software developer environment and the complete set of instructions that generates the figures in this case, but obviously also generates the uh, results. So uh, addressing some of the, the things that I've talked about uh, is, is, is one simple way to uh, effectively improving on the current situation. And another slogan, this is from Philip Stark, um, uh, which I think captures that quite nicely, is this idea that science should be show me, not trust me. So again, you're not just publishing the ad for the work, you're actually publishing the work. You're putting out there the work. It should be help me if you can, not catch me if you can. Right? So I should put out all my work out there, and then there will be mistakes. Mistakes are there, mistakes are in all my papers, I'm sure. Uh, the point is that if I put out code and uh, the analysis pipeline that went into producing my results and somebody finds a mistake, yeah, I made a mistake. Everybody makes a mistake. If, um, if I don't have uh, that out there, then maybe I was dishonest. I didn't want to show the workings because I was being dishonest. Okay, I don't know if there are any newbies here, but if there are, um, this uh, field is quite overwhelming uh, because there is so much out there. There is so much interest, which is great, but there is also a lot out there. So I put up a few uh, resources, books and articles that I recommend to people. Um, feel free to take a picture if, if, if that's your thing. Um, but there are many others out there. Um, there are also courses, for example, at Oxford we have an IT uh, learning uh, department uh, and I just put the Oxford one up here just to remind myself to say that your university will hopefully likely have also have a training program uh, where you can pick up a number of the skills that you need uh, to do this work. Um, and then uh, I also put up here uh, lessons and workshops developed by uh, Sotter and Data Carpentry. Sotter and Data Carpentry are volunteer organizations based in the US um, that for several years now effectively uh, have as their mission uh, to provide training to researchers in the analytical and uh, programming and data management skills that they need to make their work more robust and uh, reproducible. And now briefly, I'll just talk about um, how we've done this at Oxford. Um, so for the last uh, couple of years, I've been running a project called Reproducible Research Oxford. And uh, the idea was to set this up so that we could provide training to everybody across the university, uh, staff, students, and researchers um, in, in these areas. So the overall aim or my ambition when I set this up was to see the process of change in, in the approach to research computing across the university by teaching researchers the skills that they need for reproducibility. Um, so to do this, we set up a partnership with Software and Data Carpentry um, via some funding from the university. And we've been going now for close to two years. And what we do is to deliver uh, four workshops a year, sometimes more, open to everybody, open and free to everybody across the university. 
Um, and we also train local instructors so that they have the skills to then go and run these workshops and provide these trainings in their own department, in their own research groups across the university. Um, so, so far we've delivered, I think, six, seven, eight workshops, I've lost uh, count. Uh, so that's uh, probably catering to 100, 150 uh, people from across the university. Uh, and we've uh, provided training to um, 18 instructors. Um, so we have a small army of people who are trained to uh, provide this training going forward. Um, and I can tell you that offering these, these uh, workshops, we get attendance from all disciplines, from the humanities, the social sciences, um, uh, and the natural sciences, maths, physics, so the medical sciences also. So there is a hunger for a need for training in these areas that really spans um, all uh, departments. Uh, if you are in Oxford or nearby, feel free to get involved. We have various ways of, of, that, you, that you can sort of use to get in touch um, and find out about upcoming workshops. Um, uh, so if you are in, 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 in Oxford nearby, the, the best way to get in touch uh, or to take part is, is to attend the workshop as a, as, a, as a learner or to volunteer as a host, a helper or an instructor. Um, just to give you a favour of what we've done, the last workshop we run was in May where we provided instructor training to six uh, instructors um, and Tanya in fact was, the next speaker, was uh, one of our trainer who, who provided the training for the uh, instructors. Um, and the next work workshop that we're planning now is a software carpentry workshop in September where we'll cover Shell, Git and R. Just to give you the one minute intro to these workshops, what we cover uh, is effectively how to uh, interact with your machine uh, via the, the Shell. Um, then we cover version control, typically Git, uh, but, and, and, and then a programming language, in this case R. Uh, the idea is not to teach you Git or R, it's, it's, it's impossible to do that in two days. Uh, the idea is to take a complete novice and um, have him or her embrace a different way of interacting with their machines. So this is the aim of these workshops. There's a lot of, as we all know, there's, there's a lot of work that goes on uh, in, in the solitude of your room and banging your head against your <laughs> desk to become proficient in any of these tools, but this is a way of of, of making uh, novices aware that there is a different way of uh, doing things out there. And then finally, just a cheeky plug, we're coming to the end of our funding uh, for this project, so if you're in a position to uh, help, uh, we are looking for sponsors, and so come talk to me um, later. Thank you.